Okay, well, welcome to Free Speech Zone. This is the first show of the Free Speech Zone series. We changed the name because I think in TV Guide, uh, when the people see 9-11 was an inside job, I think they just keep going. But Free Speech Zone is a little more generic, and it matches kind of the way I do the show anyway. So this is essentially the same show you've all been watching. Uh, the names have been changed to protect the innocent, okay? <laughs> so we're going to start out today with, uh, well... My general complaint is that the national security state is doing its job very well. Remember its job? Remember from that last episode where I started describing national security state? The, the job of the national security state is perpetual war, okay? And Obama has been doing his spin doctor dance to, to sell us this new war or multiple wars. We don't even know what war there is. Interview the people on the street. They don't know what wars we're fighting or what wars we're not fighting or who ISIS is or who ISIL or IS or Al-Qaeda, Hamas, Hezbollah. They're all the same, aren't they? Yeah, they're all just one big hodgepodge of terrorism and we have to have a global war on terrorism to stop them. Okay, well... You know, Alex Jones has been ranting for a long time about how Bill Gates and other globalist elites have been threatening to spread Ebola and other diseases. And Bill Gates was even talking about the new mosquito uh, virus that they figured out how to spread by mosquitoes, uh, one that get, it spreads uh, infertility to humans. Uh, that's one thing. And, you know, I just kind of write these off sometimes because... I, I'm, I'm still so naive, I don't believe that our, anybody in our country would do any of that stuff. And I, I want to keep my naivety, but it, it just so happens that virtually everything that Alex Jones has been predicting is coming true. Uh, now, you know, that doesn't mean he's not an alarmist and that you don't have to filter what he says. But I'm going to go ahead and play a cut here about the Ebola thing. You know, Ebola was... By our own laws, the CDC has laws about uh, dangerous diseases like Ebola. It, it needs a level four containment, which is much higher than than any hospitals usually. But this Ebola case was brought into the United States and put in a level two, contrary to law. Now, why do you suppose that happened? It happens to be consistent with the story that... Uh, Alex Jones was saying about a deliberate attempt to reduce our population by 90%. That's right, 90%. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I know that they that the writings of these rich elites, that the writings actually want 90% reduction. But do they have the power? And if you say they don't have the power, then you have to say that this Ebola outbreak that they're bringing in is just a complete comedy of errors, an accident waiting to happen, a bunch of buffoons running around that don't know anything about how to handle infectious diseases, that the CDC is made up of clowns that don't have anything but a paper degree, and all that sort of stuff. Or you could actually believe maybe there's something that we better look into. Because if this stuff is being spread deliberately, and if it is just a coincidence, if it isn't just a coincidence that it's following the writings of the elite, then we better start prosecuting and stop it. But anyway, let's, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and start this one going here. This is just a short one, about three minutes. The door's not locked. Inside, an officer confronts Gonzalez but is overpowered. Alarm boxes are near the front door. They're silenced because the White House staff complained they were too noisy. You see these kind of cosmetic, you know, air quotes here, optics issues all the time. Well, we don't want to bother the president. We don't want to bother the ushers. Well, do you want to keep them alive? The director of the Secret Service has resigned. There have been multiple recent security breaches that have led up to this announcement. Besides the White House fence jumper who made it well beyond the front door, it's being reported that the final straw was that an armed private contractor shared an elevator with the president at CDC headquarters. But that's not to say that the Secret Service isn't working. The Fox brothers, who produced Conrad the Constitution, were visited by the service for making a cartoon that portrays the assassination of the president. Hey Chris, was I supposed to get the Colombian hookers tonight? Remember. You 
knows nothing, Baldy. The brothers were eventually found not to be a threat. Also, when the president came to the LBJ Museum in Austin, InfoWars went in hopes of getting in a question. Even though we went through the process of getting credentialed, we were informed that we weren't selected by the service to attend the president's address. We couldn't even get within several hundred yards of the presidential convoy to get decent footage. This is security theater at its finest. Crack down on the media and keep the reporters at bay, but someone can literally waltz into the White House. You can find more reports at InfoWars.com. In the past decade, we have witnessed unparalleled scientific discoveries in the area of health, but no one... Yeah, we, we have to kill it before the commercial gets going there. I guess I'm the one who could stop it. Well, anyway, the, the point is, here we have this Ebola outbreak of, you know, what is it? Over 80 people are suspected of having Ebola now in Texas. And it started out with just one, and the CDC was announcing that they could have it under control and all that. But we didn't we don't have any of that on the on the mainstream media. But what do we have on mainstream media? The security circus. About this clown that run, runs across the state the uh, White House lawn and goes into the White House. I mean, oh, come on folks. We're going to we're going to spend all our energy on that clown who turned out not to be even a threat. It just embarrassed everybody and they fired people over it. Do you realize that they didn't fire anybody over negligence of 9-11? I mean, the FAA pointed at NORAD. NORAD pointed at the FAA. They all pointed at the Pentagon for negligence or, or incompetence, and nobody got fired. You know, and that that's, doesn't happen unless, well, if you fire somebody, the story comes out, I guess. So this Ebola thing is spreading in the United States and we're we're distracting everybody's attention with the clown that runs across the field. So well in the meantime we're doing dastardly things. The courts just ruled that water is not a human right. You don't have the right to drink water. That's not your right. We if we privatize water you have to buy it. Period. And you die if you can't afford it. Too bad. It's not your right. Okay, so that's one of the ways that our court system and, and the ideology of capitalism is absolutely screwed. Uh, and in Detroit, that's where the ruling was made about the people in Detroit who've just had their water shut off because the city's going bankrupt. Uh, hello, you know, we... <laughs> We used to do humanitarian rescue missions for, for crises like that. So how come the military isn't bombing the neighborhood with, with sacks of water? Uh, it's amazing. Well, let's go ahead and play. This is Abby Martin, and she's going to be talking about a, a host of things. And uh, as usual, I don't cover anything as, nearly as well as these other people. So thank goodness for that, or my show wouldn't be worth watching. So go ahead and run that uh, Abby Martin clip. What's up, everyone? I'm Abby Martin, and this is Breaking the Set. As the media shifts its focus from ISIS militants to Ebola to George Clooney's wedding, people seem to have largely forgotten about a dire human rights situation in another corner of the world. Guantanamo Bay Prison is still holding 149 men indefinitely. 143 of them have never been levied charges nor faced trial and have been rotting behind concrete walls for years. Historically, the only avenue for prisoners to get attention to their struggle is by going on a hunger strike. And there have already been two mass hunger strikes at the prison, the second involving up to 106 prisoners at its height in 2013. This, plus news that at least 45 of the men were being routinely force-fed, propelled the story into international headlines, causing the government to re-strategize. So they turned to euphemisms, calling it a long-term non-religious fast. Furthermore, daily briefs were no longer issued concerning the amount of men on the strike, and tapes of the dehumanizing procedure remain classified. Force-feeding prisoners is considered a violation of international law under the Tokyo Convention. And according to Yemeni prisoner Ahmad Hassan, the process is akin to torture. He describes that detainees are strapped in what's called a torture chair, given laxatives while being force-fed excess liquid through oversized tubes 
that are repeatedly shoved through their nostrils. Now, after deafening silence on behalf of Guantanamo officials and the White House about this daily violation of medical ethics, Obama's finally asked a judge to hold a long-awaited hearing on the procedure. Big problem, though. Mr. Transparency wants it all done in secret. Because national security, according to The Guardian, should the judge approve the government's request, the first major legal battle over force feeding in a federal court would be less transparent than the military commissions at Guantanamo Bay. Look, the same judge has already shown where her allegiance lies by preventing the release of the classified tapes of the force feedings. Clearly, there's a lot to hide here. And this latest measure is just another move to silence the plight of these men. But if public pressure continues to mount, they can't keep this egregious practice in the shadows forever. Well, let's break the set. Speculation has been replacing hard fact. Terrorists don't read Twitter. Who's right and who's wrong? It was a terrible thing to say, period. The mistake entirely on me. What we need is to question more and to keep it uncensored, real and raw. These words are hard hitting, you're watching your neck, but you need to tune in because we're right what you said. Since March of this year, the city of Detroit has been rocked by an unreported human rights crisis, underreported rather. See, an estimated 22,000 people have been left without access to potable water simply because they were behind on their payments. This according to Detroit's Water and Sewage Department. Now, city officials claim that the shutoffs are necessary because of the dire financial situation of the local economy, as Detroit recently filed the largest municipal bankruptcy in U.S. history. To them, the logic is simple. If you can't pay your bills, then you shouldn't get water. Well, a short-lived moratorium put a stop to mass shutoffs earlier this summer, but only after a wave of protests as well as widespread condemnation from groups like the NAACP, Amnesty International, and even the UN, which said that cutting water to the poorest residents of Detroit is a violation of human rights. But with little being done to fix the problem, grassroots organizations have been working hard to empower residents from the ground up. One such activist is Makita Taylor of the Detroit Water Brigade, who says that not thinking of water as a human right is beyond comprehension. Anyone who would equate a life with a, a payment of a bill, is that, that's just really difficult for me to understand. I wouldn't teach my children that. You know, that if someone is hungry, you leave them hungry because they don't have food. Or if someone needs a, a, a life survival, something that keeps them alive, you're going to deny them that because of a piece of paper called money. I, I just, I really find that difficult to understand. Um, but I do know that there are people in the world who feel that way. And, you know, what can you do about that? Is that the predominant attitude of most Americans? That's, that's the question that I've been asking. Taylor's organization has been so successful in raising awareness about the plight of thousands of underprivileged Detroiters that it's captured the support of at least one U.S. lawmaker. In response to the crisis, Michigan Congressman John Conyers said, actions that deny residents the ability to bathe, hydrate, or prepare meals for themselves and their families create costly, long-term public health challenges. These water cutoffs are not only inhumane, but economically short-sighted. See, this issue is not nearly as simple as unpaid bills. Detroit residents are also plagued with skyrocketing unemployment and the remnants of a financial crisis that's left one in five individuals with homes in foreclosure, a recipe for disaster in a city that's already affected by widespread poverty. Unfortunately, despite the international attention and grassroots mobilization, a judge overseeing the city's bankruptcy case just cemented the notion that water is not a human right ruling that the shutoffs can continue as long as residents aren't paying for the product. Product. See, that's what this has become. In one of capitalism's sacrifice zones, a resource vital to the survival of all living things is considered just another commodity. And as long as this society keeps treating water as a product that can be privatized instead of shared among the commons, we have zero moral high ground to impose humanitarian ideals on anyone else.
As the 2014 UN General Assembly comes to an end, world leaders are giving themselves a pat on the back for attempting to tackle every problem from climate change to Ebola. But perhaps no achievement has been highlighted more by diplomats than an anti-terrorism resolution unanimously passed by the Security Council last week. All 15 members of the Council approved Resolution 2178, which condemns violent extremism and calls for member states to prevent funding for terrorists and crack down on their ability to travel. Sounds common sense enough. After all, who couldn't, who wouldn't get behind condemning terrorism? But some civil liberty advocates are concerned that the resolution contains similar elements as the USA Patriot Act, a 9-11 piece of legislation that codified much of the mass surveillance state and Fourth Amendment violations we see today. And despite these concerns, there's been virtually no scrutiny of the vagueness of the resolution's language and its specific provisions. So here to discuss how this resolution could change the behavior of world governments, I'm joined now by RT correspondent Marina Portnaya. Uh, Marina, let's start by outlining exactly what UN Resolution 2178 calls for with regards to restricting international travel and enhancing global surveillance. Well, Abby, the resolution requires all UN member states to take a series of measures to prevent the movement and recruitment of foreign terrorist fighters. So, for example, law enforcement agents now have the authority to prevent and suppress what they deem as recruiting, organizing, transporting, or equipping of individuals who travel to a foreign country for the purpose of committing uh, terrorist attacks. Officials can prevent people from traveling if they have, quote, credible information that provides provides reasonable grounds, unquote. But what that actually means, we don't know because that statement wasn't defined in the re resolution. Uh, extremely interesting there because all we heard was kind of a, a round of applause that everyone can, can agree to this one measure, Marina. And considering that the UN is only as powerful as the member states that make it up, does this resolution actually have any legal backing behind it? And why do you think it was passed unanimously without much debate? Oh, make no mistake, this resolution has a lot of backing and it is legally binding because it was adopted by the UN Security Council. That means violating this resolution would be a violation of international law. You have to consider the climate under which the resolution was unanimously adopted. We just saw the US-led coalition uh, of airstrikes against Iran and Syria begin. The US says it was to target uh, Islamic State militants. Europe also just announced that 3,000 of its citizens have traveled overseas to join ISIS. The U.S. says at least 100 Americans have done the same. So with the fear over these foreign terrorist fighters growing, what country wants to be the one to veto or vote against a resolution that's allegedly aimed at combating an international threat? So here we have clearly all these countries of the Security Council agreeing on a text. And so let's talk about the concerns here. Why are civil liberties advocates concerned with the text? Well, Abby, if you read the text of the resolution, it requires governments to grant uh, law enforcement authorities a wider scope to monitor and suppress the travel uh, and other activities of suspected foreign terrorists. But how each country defines potential terrorists or jihadists is different. This could allow countries to monitor more people in the name of international security. Additionally, Human Rights Watch says the resolution is rampant with potential due process violations because the text doesn't articulate the process in which suspects would be denied their right to travel. And some critics say the provisions, uh, some provisions of the resolution actually promote the idea that people can be prosecuted for their thoughts and beliefs but not their actions. So basically this resolution does not spe specifically detail what exact criminal conduct is a re prerequisite for detention. You bring up a really good point, which is that it's kind of all up to the discretion of these member states, Marina, of, of what deems a terrorist threat or, or, or extremist thought, radicalization. Of course, there's also worries from some advocacy groups about racial profiling, but it does say specifically that it would not base stereotypical profiling um, prohibiting travel. Is there any reason why those people should be concerned? Well, yes, of course, the resolution does say that there should be no racial profiling uh, used at all. But according to foreign policy, one provision in the resolution encourages states to employ what's called evidence-based traveler risk assessment and screening 
procedures. Uh, that means that they could include a traveler's previous itinerary for potential grounds for detention. That means that if an immigrant is visiting a family somewhere in the Middle East or North Africa, they're more likely to be stopped and questioned at the airport than someone that's uh, visiting maybe the UK, for example. One counterterrorism expert has predicted that the resolution's warning to avoid racial profiling will be ignored and that more people uh, with long beards and skull caps will be taken out of line at airports than the guy wearing, you know, a polo shirt or a suit and tie. Right. I mean, of course, we hear that with stop and frisk, right? Oh, no, it's not racial profiling, but then you look at the yeah. you look at the actual statistics, and of course, that's what's going to be happening. Um, though, of course, there's also concerns that this resolution could be used for an excuse uh, to implement repressive measures on uh, populations as well. Why? Well, because the resolution could end up giving states new tools to crack down on separat separat separatist groups or dissidents or activists by actually branding them as terrorists. Because critics say the text of the resolution, it is vague enough that it leaves it up to each country to decide who to target. Think about countries like Bahrain or Saudi Arabia who are already squashing political opposition groups. The fear is that now those said governments and other governments too, we shouldn't just limit it to them. It could be any, any country uh, can label anyone who's an inconvenience to them as a far, foreign terrorist fighter or suspected foreign terrorist fighter. Uh, Marina, it's a shame that kind of ISIS has overshadowed uh, the intense scrutiny over the NSA surveillance program that we've been seeing in years past. Um, it's just really unfortunate that they're using this as kind of a linchpin to crack down even more. Thank you so much for bringing attention to it, Marina Portnoy. I appreciate it. Thank you, Abby. Coming up, I'll talk about California's positive environmental move. Stay tuned. <laughs> You know that guy who wishes someone would spy on him? How about the woman who enjoys being lied to by her government? This citizen can't get enough congressional inaction, and this taxpayer wants the mainstream media to be more corporatized. While this person would rather eat Jeanette. Well, we started to play a commercial and I didn't want to lose my right to play on cable access and I didn't realize that commercial was in there. That's how poorly prepared I am. I apologize to my audience. Uh, what we can do while we, while we get that one set up again uh, for the next part, I have one keyed up right now that is that uh, InfoWars 80 people infected by Ebola one that I thought I was introducing at the beginning. We'll get them all in, I just maybe not to match <laughs> my introductions but uh, let's see this is weird it's here it starts it over okay it's going now so go ahead and bring it in I'll back it up there Okay, bring it in. Infowars.com in Dallas, Texas, the birthplace of Ebola in America. Now, yesterday we attended the press conference. They said that there was a 0% chance that this was going to get out of hand. Now, towards the end of the day yesterday, we knew there were up to 12 or 18 people who had been in contact with this person. Now, it's only been less than 24 hours later. It's a new day, and now they're saying 80 people are being monitored. This one person can affect up to 80 people. That is crazy. This is a scary situation. Meanwhile, the CDC wants to tell you that there's nothing going on, that everything's fine. There's nothing to worry about. Continue going to school. Continue letting your child go out there. But the parents are saying no. The parents are pulling their kids out of the schools here because we know five children went to four of the local schools in the area. So this, the parents are scared. They're pulling them out of there. I would do it too. Would you let your kid get into a, a pool if there was a 1% chance that he could drown? Negative. You're not going to let that happen. You're not going to let your kid drink an orange juice if there was a 1% chance it might be tainted with something. So why would you allow this? Wake up. This is intense. This is crazy. We're getting to reports that there's a possible Ebola patient in Hawaii. Hawaii is not a very big place. That place could go quick. 
That's what's really scary. And, uh, and imagine all those people are going to be trying to fly back into California to get treatment here in America. That's scary. This is out of control. Keep watching these reports. Stay up to date. Stay clean. Wash your hands. I'm Joe Biggs with InfoWars.com. Okay. Um, now you see what I'm talking about. Things are getting out of control. And Abby Martin just told you about the, uh, the, the new Worldwide Patriot Act. That's, that's how it's being characterized, the new UN law that was signed into law. And I just want to point out, you know, you've heard me say before that people never want a war. It's always the governments that want the war. So who benefits by this anti-terrorism thing, considering that there really isn't any terrorism to worry about? You're more likely to get struck by lightning than you are to get hurt by terrorism. So it's got to be something, I mean, since it obviously isn't meant to protect anybody, what is it really there for? And they went down in line talking about, well, they, each country can declare who is and who isn't a terrorist target for the new law. And that's exactly the way they use laws here in the United States, too. And, you know, if anybody ever questions when you say that we're a police state or moving into a police state, <laughs> point out that this type of thing doesn't happen in, in anything but a police state. So... We're going to go ahead and play the rest of the Abby Martin clip. We jump past the commercial and we'll play the uh, the rest of her news. And it's you should be watching Abby Martin every day on your own, actually. In a groundbreaking new move, yesterday, California Governor Jerry Brown signed an unprecedented law that bans single-use plastic bags at grocery and convenience stores. California is now the first state in the entire country to enact such a ban, which completely replaces plastic at the checkout counter and requires store clerks to charge shoppers 10 cents to use paper bags instead. After signing the legislation, Governor Brown added that, quote, the bill is a step in the right direction. It reduces the torrent of plastic polluting our beaches, parks, and even the vast ocean. We're the first to ban these bags, and we won't be the last. Every year, the Golden State throws away over 13 billion plastic bags, amounting to 123,000 tons of waste. Wow, according to the nonprofit group Environment California. This means that in terms of pollution reduction, the new state law is certainly a welcome relief. So to go over just a few of the details of the new law, I'm joined by RT correspondent Lindsay France from LA. Lindsay, let's talk about when the new plastic ban bag, I'm sorry, bag ban takes effect and does it apply to all plastic bags? Well, Abby, we're going to see starting next summer, actually, the large stores like Walmart and Target, along with major grocery stores, uh, completely switching. And then after that, about a year after that, it'll be convenience stores and pharmacies. Now, small plastic bags are not the equal of the take-home plastic bags you see now in grocery stores. So things that hold vegetables and meats will still be uh, out there for use. But these are, we're talking about the stuff you get at the checkout counter, of course. In California here, this has already been in practice in many counties for a while. I've been living here a month. I have yet to see a plastic bag in a grocery store and I'm already using reusable. Right. We're talking about those plastic bags that are just littered beaches, uh, rivers everywhere. Um, it's insane. I'm really happy that this is happening statewide. And it sounds great. Of course, not everyone is on board. They never are. Lindsay, talk about some of the resistance uh, to this bill. It's, it's literally almost out of a comedy. So you've got these lawmakers who are uh, defending low-income voters saying, you know, the 10-cent charge is too much. Well, a simple uh, solution to that is bring your own from home, which many people, uh, certainly in L.A. County, do already and have for quite some time. Uh, the National Coalition of Plastic Bag Manufacturers is seeking a voter referendum to repeal uh, the law. This is a state where 100 cities and counties already have these policies in place on their own. Uh, so it doesn't look like he may get uh, much, much uh, luck with that, uh, the guys leading that coalition anyway. The American Forest and Paper Association blasted the bill for charging customers what, what was once a free product. And now the American Progressive Bag Alliance, didn't know there was such thing as that, aired a commercial blasting this bill, saying that it's just a cash giveaway for grocers and uh, that uh, it would lead to thousands of lost manufacturing jobs. Well, there's a $2 million loan provision in this bill. 
handing them money to switch over their operations to make recycled products. So they need to keep in mind this is a state. It's one of the most progressive in the country. These are practices that are changing the law. This law isn't necessarily changing people's practices. This law is following a societal shift already in it, place. It really is. It's a collective shift. It's hilarious. I can't imagine being part of that lobbying firm for the plastic industry and have to be fighting to get them reinstated. My God. Um, of course, it's the first state in the nation to ban them all together. How many other states are pursuing similar measures, or are, are there any? Well, already three major cities have Chicago, Austin, and Seattle. Uh, Hawaii is on track for this. Hawaii's had a massive pa a plastic bag problem for quite some time. Of course, out there is where you've got the plastic uh, Pacific, the Great Pacific garbage patch. Uh, the major states that have this, uh, at least on the list of things to, to look at coming up, are Massachusetts, New Jersey, Rhode Island, and then we've got Puerto Rico. And as you said, I mean, in the signing, the governor said, we're not the first state to ban this. We won't be the last. It's time for these uh, different groups to get on board with the way society is going with its consumerism. It's all about sustainability. Thank you so much, Lindsay, for breaking it down. Over the last few days, hundreds of presidents, prime ministers, and high-ranking diplomats descended on New York City for the United Nations General Assembly. Without a doubt, no world leader announced his presence to the American public louder than Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi. In between making bizarre Star Wars references at a rally in Central Park with Hugh Jackman and presiding over a 20,000-person spectacle at Madison Square Garden, Modi had time to meet with Obama to discuss everything from global trade policy to ISIS. But while the media fawns over Modi's rock star status while comparing him to Ronald Reagan, there's been nearly no discussion of his actual neoliberal economic policies and appalling human rights record as a government minister. So to delve deeper into Modi's first visit to the U.S., as well as other U.S. foreign policy issues, I was joined earlier by Vijay Prashad, an author and historian. I first asked him why Modi received such lavish treatment while he's in the U.S. compared to other world leaders. Very large companies were involved uh, financing this uh, big event at Madison Square Garden, and their interest is very simple. They are looking forward to the fact that uh, Mr. Modi is going to uh, break down labor laws, uh, you know, give environmental wa waivers, and help um, you know uh, Indian American firms and other firms uh, enter the Indian market. In fact, I interviewed a businessman today who told me that he was so happy because uh, Modi's uh, you know in power and business is going to have a much easier time in India. Of course, much easier time means the workers will have a harder time. Uh, you just wrote an op-ed in which you wrote, for wealthy sections of Indian America, Modi represents a strong man who evokes pride. When Modi brags about his 56-inch chest, his machismo indicates India's arrival in world affairs. How does his outward demeanor relate to his actual policies for India? Well, it's actually not just Modi. There's a, um, <clears throat> there's a strand of 21st century populism, which is about you know the leader, and the leader being the one who with his or her dynamic personality is able to cut the Gordian knot you know, of all the many problems in the world. And he has played this extremely well. You know, the in previous Indian Prime Minister, who was also a so-called reformer, had a very a much more modest demeanor, spoke softly, etc. Modi arrived, you know, with a, a personality that was on fire. He demanded attention. And he suggested that with his very charisma, he was going to solve all of India's problems. And this kind of 21st century populism is appealing to people because the problems are very difficult. They are grave. They require long-term solutions. You know, they require a reasonable discussion. All this stuff was uh, not to be there from Modi. So in his first 100 years, he's really attempted to push that 56-inch chest around. He's had his people, you know, go out there and burn files that, you know, meant, you know that have uh, information about the past in them. He's had, uh, he's been delivering waivers of, you know, of labor and environmental law. So he's been out there, you know, putting himself forward as the solution. Of course, this is terrible for a democracy that's 1.3 billion people. You know, you don't want to have one man uh, be the solution. You want to have the ability of a government to create 
you know, institutional responses to help people solve their problems. And instead of that, of course, you have a fake kind of solution where the media has utterly, utterly gone along. The media loves him because they love the flamboyance. They love the kind of uh, statements he makes. And this is very unfortunate for a sober approach to uh, India's problems. Right. They also love neoliberal policy, which uh, he embraces wholeheartedly there. He also met with President Obama, um, where they discussed the threat of ISIS. I wanted to kind of transition over to something that you've also been very vocal about. Um, now that we're in the second week of the new war in Syria, we're starting to see the toll of civilian casualties, including a strike that killed seven civilians, including five children, two days ago. Do you consider these strikes war crimes? Of course, these strikes are war crimes. By the way, firstly, the strike itself, uh, the U.S. strikes in Syria are not authorized by anybody. There is no international authorization. In other words, there's no, there was not even an attempt to have a U.N. Security Council resolution. So they, it's very sketchy about the, um, you know, the, the legality on international grounds. There was no attempt to have any kind of congressional uh, oversight or any congressional discussion about these strikes. So it's unclear whether there's any national uh, validation for it. Once again, you have a kind of personality politics. President Obama speaks. He says it's essential. He says that ISIS is a grave threat and therefore he can bomb. I mean, this is the same kind of thing. Institutional power is set aside. Mr. Modi does this in India. Mr. Obama is doing it on a world stage. They've completely set aside international institutions. You go ahead, do what you want, because you think it's the correct thing to do. And then, of course, civilians die. Now, it's not only a case of civilian death. There have been, I think, very credible reports that the Obama administration has told the military that whatever handcuffs they have, you know, uh, to beware of, of civilian casualties has been removed. Meanwhile, Rear Admiral Kirby has said that he's not even sure the strikes are going to have an effect against ISIS. Right. I wanted to jump in there because the White House just announced that that new measure that you just kind of outlined, that airstrikes in Iraq and Syria don't have to adhere to the same standards as normal drone strikes. Of course, I think all of them are war crimes, but why should Syria and Iraq be exempt from these rules that would minimize civilian casualties? Well, you know, it's actually, uh, there are two um, admissions of defeat already in this. The first admission of defeat is the United States after 13 years, you know, sorry, not 13 years, 11 years, has gone back to bombing in Iraq. That, I think, is something for people to consider after considerable cost of both, uh, you know, human life, Iraqi life, American life, the life of the other coalition forces, immense, uh, you know, uh, uh, material cost as well. The United States is back to square one, back to shock and awe in Iraq. That's an admission of defeat. In Syria, the very fact that the United States has had to say, let's change our rules of engagement, let's allow for civilian casualties, demonstrates that defeat is on hand. In other words, they've understood that aerial bombardment is not going to get ISIS. The ISIS fighters have disappeared. They have vanished into civilian areas. They're not going to wait around, you know, to be bombed from 30,000 feet. This is the reason why the government has to say, well, then let's go and bomb civilian areas. It's, it's an admission that this strategy is a failure. You need to have a strategy on the ground to deal with the Islamic State, and the American government simply is not capable of creating an on-the-ground strategy. Let's wrap this up. We have about a minute left, but I wanted to read a quote from a recent interview with Noam Chomsky, where he says, like Britain before, the U.S. has tended to support radical Islam and to oppose secular nationalism, which both imperial states have regarded as more threatening to their goals of domination and control. When secular opinions are crushed, religious extremism often fills the vacuum, of course, um, kind of uh, tells a tale of what we've seen unfold in the Middle East. What's your reaction to that sentiment and, and kind of what's the solution here um, with the U.S. out of the way? Well, you know, what uh, Noam says there is absolutely true and it applies as much to Israel, which has in its prisons people like Mr. Barghouti who are committed nonviolent secular activists. Why does Israel keep non-violent people in prison and then pretend that the Palestinian resistance is entirely Hamas. You know, it's the same kind of game that all of them play. There's actually a simple um, pathway to not a solution in Syria, but to draw down the conflict. You know, the two things that the American government or three things must do or should do or could do, but will not do, 
because of their politics. One is to insist that Turkey close the border uh, for the jihadi fighters to enter and to return for medical treatment. That should be the first thing that you know sane people call for. The second thing is a political solution in Syria. You know, you have to close down the violence in Syria. But of course, the West is committed to increasing the violence. And the third thing is it's very important for uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia to hold a serious discussion towards some kind of grand bargain. Because it's too bad that this 30 to 40 year cold war between Iran and Saudi Arabia has had such deleterious effects for the region. A grand bargain between these two important countries would go a long way toward cooling things down in a region that has been too hot for too long. Thank you so much, Vijay Prashad, author of The Poor Nations. Always incredible insight. Thanks a lot. Okay, so, you know, you, you wonder when's it going to stop? Netanyahu just made a big speech in front of the UN, uh, say, you know, promising the two state solution still at hand, you know, at the same time as authorizing the biggest rush of settlements in the West Bank for years. So they're, they're making it irreversible at the same time as giving lip service. It, it's just amazing. Um, now, I was talking about the Ebola and how it might be being used in an international conspiracy. Uh, we already know that our own people have weaponized Ebola. Uh, they weaponized a whole bunch of bad stuff. Um, <clears throat> well, people, some people think that Ebola is a the October surprise for this election cycle. Uh, it's only the midterm, so you know I'm not so sure about October surprises being worth putting on in the midterm, but uh, maybe they are. Here, this is a little three-minute clip that we're about to play here. It's Alex Jones, and you'll get to hear all the frightening things that it could be uh, on this little short clip. I, I picked it specifically because a, a caller calls in and he goes through quickly what he thinks everybody should be aware of and uh, then um, the InfoWars spokesman kind of fills in some more. So we'll go ahead and play this. Up next on the line is Alan in Maryland. Go ahead, Alan. You're on the air. Good afternoon there, uh, Paul. That's some fine work you're doing over there at InfoWars. Now, I'm going to make three points, and I'm going to make it very clear and make it quick. Bill Gates and Warren, Guff Warren Buffett are up to their necks in this stuff. They're trying to clear out Africa. We know that America is being dissolved in a vat of political acid, and China has been moving into Africa for years. So this is a way to get them, you know, uh, basically startled, stop their progress, et cetera. Bill Gates said the other night that this is not going to be the last epidemic. Bill Gates is up to his neck in this. We've been attacking vaccines now for, what, five years. Alex has been doing it for forever. And we know full well we put a huge dent in their money machine. I'll tell you something, folks. What we're looking at here is a false flag. The CDC lost smallpox a truckload of smallpox, so they had to cover that up with Ebola. Now, Ebola is not going to affect us the way it does in Africa because we have fresh water, fresh food, vitamin C, vitamins, and especially we have Alex Jones and all his products and Dr. Group. But I want people to be on board here. The gentleman mentioned the October surprise. We've heard Robert Tosh Plumley talk about false flags. You listen to these people speak. You look at their writings. Pay attention to silent weapons for quiet wars, quiet wars for silent weapons. When they tell you that superbugs are coming and they're here, you better believe they are not going to lose the money. You know, Rockefeller, you've got Rockefeller, you've got Kissinger all over the place, you've got Brzezinski out there blabbing his mouth. Ladies and gentlemen, this is how they roll. And I tweeted, what bioweapon are they going to release on us next? Three months ago. And within 30 days, we had Ebola, and there you have it. Well, it's, it's interesting because actually Louis Farrakhan, of all people, came out today and cited Dick Cheney's Rebuilding America's Defenses document, where he said that 
you know, germ warfare, bio warfare would improve to the point where it could target individual races. Obviously, I don't think that's the case with Ebola because we've had a lot of uh, American health workers that have been infected with it that have come back. But definitely that's something that they had in the offing in terms of Africa. As you said, China's got huge investment in that country. They're trying to absorb it into the BRICS financial structure that is uh, destined to take in on America. And that's the case. In Africa, there's there's a lot of, um, of rallying back between America and China. Uh, China has investments in America, in Africa, which dwarf those of America. We had these troops sent in by Obama recently to deal with the Ebola outbreak. A lot of questions being asked about what good troops would do in such a situation. And again, a lot of information should suggest that it could have been uh, an undercover attempt to subvert, to infiltrate Africa uh, in the guise of fighting Ebola, when in reality it was a geopolitical move against China. So we'll get into that and more after the break. David Knight's coming up in studio next. It's the Alex Jones Show Live. Stay tuned. Of course, uh, we aren't going to play the rest of that. We're, oops. We'll, we'll just be, we're going to go straight to another video. Now, this one is also the Alex Jones Show, but they have a guest on. And the guest is going to be talking about a recent uh, call by a law professor for infiltration of dissident groups. Does that sound familiar? Remember Cass Sunstein? He wrote that uh, book. Well, he wrote a paper and then later on a book was written about him. Cognitive infiltration. Yeah, okay. So we're going to go ahead and play this. And this is longer than the amount of time we have left. So... If you like what you hear, you can go to Infowars.com and hear the rest, and we'll be back next week. Stream talking heads lashing out. It's always fun to abuse them on Twitter like, like I did with Keith Olbermann. But often they come, they come to me. They lash out against Infowars without even you know being prodded in the first place. You mentioned Cass Sunstein with the cognitive infiltration, subverting the so-called conspiracy movement. This just suggests to me nothing else but how insecure they are about being challenged on any narrative whatsoever. Whatsoever. What does it say to you about their insecurity? Well, first and foremost, you mentioned Twitter and, and a shameless plug for mine. And I watch, I tweet, and retweet and favorite. And if I could do something else to, to add approbation to your tweets, I would. But I'm at Lionel Media and I'm a Twitter fanatic. I, I think it is the pulse and the heartbeat of the world. But here is the thing I don't understand. When, I, I, and, and I don't want to just make too much out of this, but how much can I question? Let me ask again. Is there a statute of limitations to that which I question? If I think there were very serious questions as to Vietnam and our involvement and the Gulf of Tonkin, which has been admitted, does that not, does, is that exempted? Next, how can somebody who is theoretically conversant with the First Amendment, a legal scholar at some of the best, sensibly, legal uh, or law schools in the nation, dare to suggest that the government, ostensibly, should be involved in quashing and quelling and, and, uh, and, and basically stifling speech? As you know, Paul, the First Amendment, in fact, the Bill of Rights, only limits action when the federal government or the state government are involved in violating your law. The federal government, the state government, has to violate your First Amendment right, not individual citizens. The 13th Amendment is the only Bill of Rights, the only constitutional amendment that a private citizen can actually violate, can actually commit. It's the slavery or anti-slavery provision and variations thereof. So here we have, and just think about this, the irony of this. A law professor advocating, not boycotting, which is fine. By God, if those conspiracy theorists out there spew this bunkum, why you tell them? Fine. Write your congressman. Fine. Petition. Go ahead. Nothing wrong with it. They're talking about cognitive infiltration via the government. This is this this erases any any doubt as to a First Amendment. Uh, involvement in this. How, how can anyone not say, wait a minute, hold the press to stop with a president who is ostensibly a constitutional professor? I mean, and this is 
This is so blatant, so pathetic, as you say, so desperate, so uh, so much of an indicium, of an indication of how this is making a headway. Uh, and again, there are so many levels. The word conspiracy theorist, I, hate, I, I love to hearken back to the great Gore Vidal, who said, I am not a conspiracy theorist. I'm a conspiracy analyst. And the word conspiracy theory has been basically a code word for the unspeakable truth. And if you're a truther, how did they appropriate truther as a pejorative? How did this happen? A falser, I can understand. And if you ask any questions, any questions from, you pick the subject. This is, we, we need to revolt Violent. I mean, not violent. Uh, non-violently. What am I saying? Non-extremist. But but say, wait a minute. No, no. We are not going to do this. And the best way to protest this non-violently is to fill the airways, fill the Twitter world, the 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 ether, the social media, with your protestations against this idea. Because remember, Paul, what what you were talking about this entire first portion of the show was how the government is not being straight with you and with us regarding Ebola. Is that a conspiracy theory? And if it is, who's conspiring? Who are the conspirators? I don't understand. You might be saying that the government's inept. The government's not doing its job. The government's dropping the ball. We need better CDC uh, officials. We need to, to fund them. They're, they're, they're inept. That's not conspiratorial false flag inside job. You just might be saying, you guys don't know what the hell you're doing. It's that simple. We're talking with Lionel, lionelmedia.com. Mercedes in Oregon, you're on the air with Lionel. Go ahead, Mercedes. Hello, Lionel and Paul. Welcome. Um, I wanted to say welcome to, uh, you know, the States, but now you're there with Ebola, so I don't know. <laughs> I don't personally you know, have Ebola be, yet, but <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Maybe you should be going home before there's a quarantine or something. Maybe, maybe but we'll all anyway, get locked in. <laughs> yeah. There are worse places but, to be locked in, though, I'll say that. <laughs> so well, what's your so question or comment for people. Lionel? Yeah, you're definitely with good people. So, yeah, extremism, we have to exactly say no. We, not only is it info wars, but um, we have to do a counter-narrative. We're the counter-narrative to what they're doing. They go in front of the UN and say these horrible things, you know? And we're just, you know, I'm on Twitter, too. I don't think I should be, uh, you know, attacked in any way by the government just for saying, hey, you guys aren't doing what you're supposed to be doing. That's exactly have, the point. I mean... <clears throat> that's precisely right. Go ahead, Lionel. No, no, that, that's precisely right. And um, Mercedes, or where I'm from, we say Mercedes. I firmly believe that not only does the... And I say the government. I don't even know what that means. It's not the government. There are people who work for the government. They're fine. They're, 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 they're great patriots and wonderful... But we use that, that, that term to, me, to, to speak of a few. But I don't think people realize how big this is. I'm telling you right now, when you listen to me, I know people in the conventional media, in the usual nuts and bolts, meat and potato, terrestrial, old-fashioned radio TV, and they're living in the 50s. Not the 1950s, the 50s. They don't know anything. They're the people who say, you know, I don't understand this Twitter. I guarantee you right now, what we're saying right now lives on in a cloud, in, a, in, a, in an area that is so huge, so colossal, so, here I invoke Gulliver, Brobdingnagian, so enormous. Mainstream media don't understand it. These people on TV who, who fancy themselves as being, you know, the cable news warriors, they, on their best day, 
they don't approximate this world out there that represents far more people than anybody can understand. So what happens is, as this, and mark my words, uh, Mercedes and, and Paul, one day, and I don't know when it is, but, but very, very soon, tomorrow, next week, somebody of note will all of a sudden say, you know what, I listen to that show, and I believe in that. And somebody will say, wow, of note. You know, when, when Jenny McCarthy, bless her heart, became viewed as the point person for concerns people had in inoculation and vaccine-related diseases, that was a dark day in any kind of, by the way, vaxxer. Have you heard that, Paul? Vaxxers. The Vaxxers. Vaxxers. That's Vaxxers. the new pejorative. Yes, yes. So we need, eventually you're going to hear more people. Rosie O'Donnell, bless her heart, Charlie Sheen. Um, they're kind of been, by virtue of a very scared media, lumped in as the standard bearers. You know, the, the, the bellwethers of, of this new, no. And this is not in any way a slam or a pejorative against them. But when you start hearing people say, no, I agree with this, or I, or I, I watch this, I, I understand this, when you start to see these the Daily Shows and, and, and Colbert and others realize that what they're doing is a cutesified, if that's a word, version of the mainstream media direct, when all of a sudden, like this, this discussion becomes cool. And people will run to it. And they will say, you mean this has been there? Yes. There are more of us than them. There was a, a person one time, a dear friend of mine, who gave the expression, he says, you know, there are so many of us that we could drown them. And I know this sounds crude, but he said, we could drown them in our urine. And I thought, oh, my God, what a horrible metaphor. But I realized we forget our power. The enormity of this, because most of us right now, we're at home or at work or we're listening maybe later, a week or so, a year later, and we look around and we're saying, is anybody out there? Oh, yes, absolutely. And all that I have said is, and I think you as well, is I'm not afraid of anything. Paul Joseph Watson, what do you wish you didn't know? What truth do you wish you didn't know? What are you sorry for knowing? What information do you wish you were dumb about? Because I haven't figured it out yet. I have not found anything where I said, boy, you know what? I wish I didn't know that historical fact. I wish I didn't know that cancer scare. I wish I didn't know the truth about this war that I thought was noble. Ignorance is not bliss. It's dangerous. And I've never apologized to anybody for wanting to know the truth. I ask questions. You've seen kids. What do kids always ask? Why? Go to room. Why? Go to bed. Why? You need your sleep. Why? And they're not being pesky. It's a beautiful question. Why? I don't understand this. I'm not satisfied. Give me an example if I could. Did you happen to see Nora O'Donnell speak uh, recently on CBS with Prince Turkey Al Faisal of Saudi Arabia? Regarding ISIS? Yeah, we played that clip on the Sunday show, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> now, wait a minute. Stop. 